worthy of all the praise, God. We're not worthy of the praise, the glory, and the honor, but you are, Father, because we're nothing without you, God. Anything that is valuable within us, Lord God, anything that is good and decent within us, Lord God, it comes from you, Father. Therefore, you're worthy of the praise. You're worthy of glory. You're worthy of honor, God. I thank you so much, Lord God, for calling us into yourself on tonight, God, on this Bible study, Father. We rely upon your strength, God, and your spirit, Lord God, that tonight would be a success, Lord God, in your name, Father. We come here in need, O oh God, in need, Lord God, of your word, God, of your truth, of your direction, Father. We pray that you would meet us where we are, God. We pray that you would supply every need in this place, Father. Praying, Lord God, that I would decrease, you would increase, God. And I would be sitting, Lord God, uh, uh, on the pew, Lord God, receiving your word, Father. Use me as a, as a vessel, God, as a microphone, God. This is your message, this is your word. And we hold it dear to our hearts, oh God. We praise you tonight, God. Bless us in what we do here tonight, God. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus name. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Hallelujah. Get situated here real quick. Everybody doing okay tonight? Tuesday evening, Bible study. <clears throat> All right. Giving all glory and honor to the Most High God. Um, man, just, you know, when I pray in my secret place, I always leave with, with gratitude. I'm just grateful. You know what I'm saying? Grateful to be um, where he called me to be. You know what I'm saying? Grateful for the blessings. I try to count my blessings every time, right? Um, start there. And uh, just want to give glory and honor to the Most High God. Thank him for health and strength, not only for myself, but for you all as well. Also want to give honor to the, to the shepherd, right? Want to give honor to the pastor. And uh, every time I'm up here and we do this, I always feel led to, uh, to pray. So we're going we're gonna to follow the spirit. If you can just stretch forward your hand. Um, some, of the, some, some of the things that come to my mind and my spirit as we pray for pastors, you know, a new schedule, different campuses, different things going on, travel, those type of things. So as we pray, we just be praying, standing in agreement with, um, with safety. All right, so let us pray. Father, we just... Thank you so much, Lord God, for our shepherd, Father, our under-shepherd, Pastor Omar, and First Lady, Lord God, Dr. Chantel. Father, we just thank you so much, Lord God, uh, for leading them and guiding them, Lord God. Over the course of so many years, Lord God, we're here now, Father, with so many new things going on, so many blessings, so many new opportunities, Father. We thank you for that, God. Thank you for blessing them in that way, God. But we stand in agreement as a church, God, as a body, Praying and asking that you would lead them and guide them, protect them, God, and travel and study and decision-making, Lord God, and those type of things, Father. We pray that you would be with them, that you would lead them by your spirit, Lord God, and that this ministry would be all that you call it to be. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're not done praying yet. We got one more. Oh. The, the second thing I kind of want to pray for is, you know, we all, where we are in our walk, we're all in the need of something, Amen. right? We're all in need of something, whether it be healing, whether it be deliverance, whether it be a word in due season, right? We all come to the Most High in need of something. You know, we can play humble and act like, oh, I'm good, I'm, I don't need nothing. We're all in need of something. So we're going to pray again and... I'm going to pray and, and call a few things out and, and follow the Spirit, but whatever it is that you're in need of, you know, audibly, call it out. Speak to the Most High God. He's our God, and He's our provider. There's nothing that He can't provide. There's no task too big for Him. So whatever it is that you're in need of, you may be going through, we're going to pray as a church and individually in your spirit, audibly as well. With your mouth, you call upon the Most High God and what you need. So if you, even if you want to stand in the gap for someone who's in need, that you know of, somebody may be in need of salvation, a child, a loved one, someone else in need of healing. You know how we do. We stand in the gap for those that we love, for those who are not here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you 
for who you are. You're so much, God. That's not a cliche thing, God. You're healer. You're deliverer, God. You're Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh Jireh, God. You're great and mighty, Lord God. Strong in battle, Father. God, we pray as a church right now, bring into you our needs, God. You say to cast our cares upon you, God. In a day's time, Lord God, there's a lot of things that we care about, God. A lot of responsibilities, Lord God. A lot of needs, oh Lord God. We come to you, Father, asking that you would supply every need according to your riches in Christ Jesus, just as your words say, God. We stand in the gap for those who may not be here, God. We stand in the gap for those who don't even think they need to be here, Lord God. For those who don't even think they need you, oh Lord God. We pray for salvation, Father. We pray deliverance, Lord God. We pray that you would uh, quicken us, Lord God, as we prepare for things, Lord God. As we, as we uh, be ambitious, Lord God, and reach for new heights, Lord God, in life, Father, we pray that you would be with us, Lord God. That you would pay every bill, Lord God. That you would settle every debt, Lord God. That you would provide wisdom, Lord God, in business, oh Lord God. That you would provide uh, absolutely everything that we need in every season, at every time, Father. We trust you wholeheartedly, Lord God, knowing that there's nothing too hard for you. We give you thanks right now, God. Before you even, it's being done right now, Father, according to our faith, God, that you provided unto us. For you have provided every man a measure of faith. So we thank you in advance for answering our prayers, for hearing our prayers first and answering, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. You can go ahead and turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. I got a little recap to do. If y'all remember, I was up uh, a few weeks ago, probably a month or so, and uh, <clears throat> we were in Luke chapter 8. Uh, we're going to be there again. Got some more things to talk about. So uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 4 through 15, we'll read. Do a recap, and then we'll get into our, um, our study tonight. Chapter 8, Luke 8, 4, and it says, And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered. It withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it out. But others fell on good ground. Somebody say good ground. ground. And sprang up and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, he who has ears... Let him hear. Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, who believe for a while, and in time of temptation, they fall away. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, When they have heard, they go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. Verse 15 is where we want to be. But the ones that fell on the good ground, somebody say good ground, ground. are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, somebody say good heart, heart. they keep it and bear fruit with patience. Father, we thank you for your holy word, your mighty word. Your word is a lamp to our feet. 
is nourishment to our souls. I ask that you would speak to us here tonight, Lord God. Anoint this service. We bind the enemy. We ask that you would set a perimeter, Lord God, around this place, Lord God. Let no weapon form prosper against us. In Jesus' name. name. Amen. All right, so about a month ago, if you recall, in our previous study, uh, once again, we were in Luke chapter 8, the parable of the sower, and we investigated the four different types of soil, which represents the four conditions of the hearts of men. We preface our study in that all of us can be categorized in one type of soil, different types of hearts, right? And specifically, we asked ourselves this question. I tried to keep repeating it. And the question was, what is the condition of my heart right now? What is the condition of your heart right now? Not where it was two years ago. Not where it was six months ago. But where is your heart right now? God don't want to use the condition of your heart where it was a year ago. God wants a a willing, available, a healthy heart now. So let's be honest. This faith journey can be hard sometimes. And your heart can acquire some bumps and bruises along the way. That's why we ask the question, where are you right now? If you aren't careful, or as the Bible says, if you aren't vigilant, then these bumps and bruises, these trials and tribulations, these adversities, uh, they can alter the condition of your heart. Just because you come to church and just because we're saved, just because we pray, we're prayerful, even serve in the church, may even serve in the leadership role, It doesn't mean that opposition, adversity, disappointment, trials, offenses do not come. Although they may not prosper, weapons still form. Would you agree? Sometimes in the form of struggles in the marriage, divorce, trouble and conflict on the job. Say people go through that too. Trouble and conflict at home, trouble with the kids, trouble, trouble, conflict, adversity among family members, among siblings. Anybody can relate? What about death of a loved one? We still go through adversity, trying times, trials. Or perhaps now you find yourself taking care of a loved one who can't take care of themselves. If you're not ready, that can be a trying time. Although James 1-2 tells us as followers of Christ to count it all joy when you fall into various trials, it isn't always easy to do. Would you agree? It says count it all joy when you fall. And it's funny how to play on words. It's like when you think about a fall, that's not necessarily a good thing. It seems like an accident. Like, you need some help. You need some assistance. The Bible says when you fall into various trials, count it joy. So in other words, rejoice about it. Be happy about it. Smile about it, in other words. Like, this doesn't feel good. This is a hardship. This is adversity. But yet, you want me to be joyful about it. This is a little contrary to what I would think, right? Typically, what I would want to count are my blessings. Anybody here like to count their blessings? Like we just pray? Yeah, I like to count my blessings, man. That's part of my praise. Like, God, you did some things. You did some great things. You know what I'm saying? But it's funny how the Bible says, count it as joy. Typically, I like to count my blessings, my accomplishments, my success. For example, 
we all can fall in these categories, right? We want to count our blessings like going to school, graduating college, um, getting saved. God just saved me. Uh, let's see here before I lose my spot. Getting married, having children, the birth of your children. Your children getting saved. I would count that. Job promotions. What's some blessings that you would count? Building a new home? Paying off a home? That's where I'm at now. A house paid for it? That's a blessing. Starting a business? Becoming a six-figure earner? Making that first million? What are some blessings you count? God healing your body? You were sick, you had cancer? You don't have cancer no more. You're not sick anymore. Those are things that I would consider to count. Uh, God delivering you from a stronghold in your life. Those are the things I would think of when they say that I would want to count. Not my trials. That's what I think of. But those, thing, those things bring me joy. I don't like to keep track of my, my failures, my low moments, my trials. I like to turn my back on those moments. I like to forget about them. I like to leave them in the past. I like to move on and press towards the mark, right? <laughs> but God encouraged us to count those hardships and trials as something to be joyful about. Baffled me. Something to smile about. Be joyful, like the joy you felt when you brought your newborn baby home from the hospital. Can you recall, parents? Why, God? Because the testing of your faith produces patience. Meaning the trials and adversity that we face produce patience and perseverance. Yes, God wants to produce beautiful, vibrant, nourishing spiritual fruit in your life. And that's what those trials do. They serve a purpose. Specifically, he wants to bear fruit in your heart. Yes, God, Yah, the Most High God, he's not satisfied with your heart being like the soil among the wayside. I remember that? The wayside, the beaten path, the footpath. Your heart being so impacted by being used as a footpath for others and being walked on that you find yourself bitter and hard-hearted to the point that the seed of God's word can't penetrate your heart. God don't want that. Nor is he okay with your heart being like the soil among rocks, where your temptations and sinful desire rob you from growing deep roots in Christ. Nor is he satisfied with your heart being like the soil among thorns, in that the thorns of the cares, riches, and pleasures of this world choke the spiritual nutrients from your life to the point that you don't mature in Christ at all. Having a form of godliness, but not according to knowledge, not growing mature in Christ, and not going from glory to glory, but instead, you remain fruitless, growthless, lukewarm, and mediocre. God don't want that. But I'm reminded of Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good. Somebody say for good. For good. And not for disaster. Right. To give you a future and a hope. Is that anyone's desire in here today? Amen. For your heart to be good ground for God's word, that the word of God would take deep root in your heart and produce all that God has purposed for you? You see, I had not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love God. Are you ready to receive what God has prepared for you? Is the condition of your heart prepared and ready 
to receive what God has for you. Again, is the condition of your heart prepared to receive all of what God has prepared for you? So we pose the question again, what is the condition of your heart right now? Not where it was a year ago. So let's study a little bit. We're going to focus on Luke chapter 8, verse 15. Let's read the text again. It says this, but the ones that fell on the good ground, say good ground, ground. are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Tonight, I only have one point, but a few sub points. So the first point is simply the heart. The heart. The word heart occurs in scripture over 800 times, y'all. 800 times in the course of seven, over 760 by 762 scriptures in both Old and New Testament. Amen. And the word heart in the Old Testament is the word lave. Say lave. L-A-V-E. Lave is, and the meaning of lave, the heart, it refers to the inner man. The inner man, which encompasses your mind, your will, and your understanding. Lave, the Hebrew word lave. Now, to put it in another another way, or in other words, the heart is the seat or the fountain of many things. It's the seat of many things. The seat of knowledge the seat of reflection and meditation. So when, when the, Psalms, the psalmist tells us to reflect or meditate on the word of God, we don't meditate just intellectually in our minds, but we meditate in our hearts. It is the seat of memory. The seat of memory. To prove that point, when you think about your childhood, when you think about holidays, and you think about family gatherings, you can remember certain things not just intellectually, but you can remember in your heart because of how it made you feel. Yeah. You remember, you can remember smells of what my mom was cooking because it just that, that feeling of love and togetherness and unity, it was just there, right? So it was more than just an intellectual seat. That memory rested in your heart because of your experience. Your lave, your heart, is the seat of memory. It is also the seat of understanding, the seat of courage. That's why we say, uh, take heart. If somebody is a good athlete or somebody who doesn't give up, they have heart, they have courage. The heart, the lave, is the seat of courage. It's also the seat of uh, your conscience, your inner man. When you pray within yourself, no words, you're praying in your heart. And God hears it. It is the seat of determination, that drive to not quit. It doesn't come from intellect, intellect, it comes from your heart. It is the seat of thoughts and imaginations. It is the seat of passions. This can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing, right? We all have a fallen nature, a sinful nature with sinful passions. Right? Those come from a fallen and a depraved heart. Why we need Jesus. That's why he came to suffer and die for us. It is the seat of appetites. Not appetites like what you're eating whenever you leave here. Right? Not a physical appetite, but a spiritual appetite. Right? What do you desire in life, in your marriage? Right? What do you desire um, in your relationship with Christ? It is the seat of appetites. And it is the fountain of moral character. We're talking about the heart. Hebrew word is lave. L-A-V-E. Lave. So my first sub point, we're going to talk about some of these uh, components or aspects of the heart. Right, These different seats. 
Uh, the first seed I want to talk about, I guess you could say sub point A, is going to be the seed of determination. The seed of determination. It's a little out of order, but follow me. It's all right. The seat of determination. That's why, because I'm backwards. The seat of understanding is number one. Thank you, Lord. The seat of understanding. Yeah, I got it nice up there. So to, to uh, reference and to study the seat of understanding, we're going to reference the scripture real quick. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5 through 12. We're going to read through it. 1 Kings 3, 5 through 12. I don't know if they're going to put it up, but we'll read. It says... That night, the Lord appeared to who? Solomon, in a dream. And God said, what do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you, Solomon. Whatever you ask me, I'll give it. Solomon replied, you showed great and faithful love to your servant, my father, <clears throat> David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued to show his great and faithful love to him today, by giving him a son to sit on his throne. Talking about himself, Solomon. Now, O oh Lord, my God, you have made me king instead of my father, David, but I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. And here I am in the midst of, my, of your own chosen people, Israel, a nation so great and numerous they cannot be counted. And still today, give me an understanding heart what Solomon asked for. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth, or death to your enemies, things that seemingly would make him a great king, I will give you what you ask for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart, such as no one else had ever or will ever or ever will have. An example of your heart being a seat of understanding. How valuable is understanding? Solomon was entering a new season of his life. He had never been king before. He had seen his dad be king. He had a good example. <clears throat> He's experiencing a new season in his life, in his career, in his purpose, in his calling. God made him king over God's people. And just like most of us, when we enter a new season, Solomon said, Solomon said I'm like a little child. I don't know my way around. I don't know what to do. Anybody ever got a promotion? You was like, I don't know how I got it. I don't know how I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing or be successful in this, but here I am. Solomon needed wisdom and understanding to effectively lead God's people, to govern them justly, to pastor them justly, to know the difference between right and wrong, to know the difference between good and evil, to know the difference between what's important and what's wasteful. The question I have tonight in this first point is where do you need wisdom in your life? Where do you need, you need understanding in your life? Without understanding, failures become traumatic. Without understanding, hard things become, they break us in a sense. Without understanding, understanding in your heart brings meaning to your failures, and they propel you to your destiny. Solomon understood that without the wisdom from God, that he wouldn't be great. He wouldn't be a great king. A few differences here, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Knowledge is what to do. And when you say somebody that's book smart, they know what to do. They can tell you what to do a thousand times over. Knowledge is what to do. And we often hear the phrase, right, knowledge is power. I think it's more true to say knowledge, uh, knowledge empowers. 
Knowledge empowers. Knowledge in and of itself may not be that powerful, but if you use it in the right way, it can be powerful. Therefore, understanding, so knowledge is what to do. Understanding is how to do it. Understanding is how to do it. And wisdom is when to do it. When to do it. These are things we need in life. This is what you need in your marriage. This is what you need in your single life. This is what you need in your role as a grandparent. This is what you need in your role as a boss, a, a manager on the job. You need knowledge. You need to know what to do. Get the education, but don't stop there. Pray for understanding. Study to show yourself approved. Seek understanding, as the Bible says. And all you're getting, get understanding. Understand how to do what it is that needs to get done. Understand how to, how to do those things. How to fix those cars. How to fix those engines. How to fix whatever it is you may be fixing, engineers. Right? For me, understand how to... Uh, lead someone in the exercise program, how to, how to coach somebody to eat well, and how to make better decisions. Wisdom is when to do it. And in my experience, a lot of people come and they want to start eating different, but they don't know when to do it. They want to do it all at one time. And that's where coaching comes into play for me. But wisdom, again, is when to do it. When to do it. Okay. Understanding. Seat of understanding. Solomon knew that in this new season of his life, he was going to need something only God could provide. Solomon knew that this understanding that he was asking for, he couldn't provide it to himself or in and of himself. And just like Solomon, we use him as an example in your new season, understand that you will need something only God can provide. Only God. Amen. Only God can put you in the right room with the right people. Only God can grace you with that wisdom of when to do what it is that you understand to do. I think about my testimony. About a year ago, I was managing, a, about a year and a half, I was managing a fitness center that closed, the hospital decided to close the fitness center altogether. Um, so everybody was being laid off. I was the manager of the fitness center at, the, at that time. And uh, they closed the fitness center, everything was closing. They pretty much used my leadership, used me as a leader to kind of transition and close everything financially, close the books, it was just the whole nine, right? And I knew I was gonna have to let everybody go. And uh, I had the knowledge of how to do it. I knew the ins and outs of the gym. I had the knowledge. I understood that, I understood how to do it, how to go about doing it. I had to pray, I had to be uh, kind of secretive and uh, discreet and not let my staff know what was going on, but at the right time uh, with, you know, with hospital executives, let them know that everything was closing. But what, what I prayed for was the wisdom of how to lead them through that. How to lead, I knew people was gonna lose their job. I knew it. I was losing mine too. But my focus wasn't so much on myself, but focus on helping others transition. <clears throat> and by the grace of God, we did. Um, I listened. I was a shoulder to cry on for a lot of people. Um, and it was good, you know, it was a trying time. But God used that season of hardships, of hard things, of making hard announcements, of helping people transition to new jobs, helping people find new gyms. Uh, the gym I managed was a lot, of, a lot of elderly folks, so that was their way of being, you know, being active every day. They didn't go and do other things. This was their social life. This was how they uh, was active every day. And when you took that from them, you know, uh, I still see them today. Some of them gained a lot of weight and not as mobile. But during that time, I learned, I gained a lot of wisdom to the point where what I learned in that season transitioned me to the new season 
to where the university that purchased the fitness center or purchased the building where the fitness center was asked me and hired me to manage the fitness center, the same fitness center, under a different ownership. <clears throat> so I had the knowledge, I knew what to do, had the education in the field, the whole nine, the understanding, but it was the experience that gave me the, the wisdom and prepared me to be where I am now, to be the manager I am now, to equip me to where I, where I am now. And it's a, the blessing has been that everything that I asked to do on the previous ownership, and they said, no, we are doing it now. The renovations, the new systems, <clears throat> you know. So my point in that is this, it's the seed of understanding. Solomon indeed asked for an understanding heart. Understand that even those hard times, those hardships, those things that look like, it look ugly and it's uncomfortable. Those are your times of preparation, your times of development. It's the seed of understanding, your heart. Moving on to the next seat here concerning the heart. Your heart is the seat of understanding, but it's also the seat of determination. The seat of determination, of drive, <clears throat> of resolution. We're going to reference Daniel chapter 1, verse 3 through 8. The Bible says this, Then the king instructed Asphanaz, the master of his, of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of his nobles. Young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve the king's palace of whom they might teach the language, literature of the, and literature of the Chaldeans. Talking about Nebuchadnezzar, we're talking about uh, Daniel and the three Hebrew boys being drawn in to learn about Babylon, to learn ab uh, about the ways of Babylon. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among them, now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And to them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, uh, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. That's where we want to be in verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart. He purposed where? In his heart. That he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel purposed in his heart to not violate the law of Moses, to not eat the food that was offered to idols, which it was a custom uh, of the Babylonians. Daniel purposed in his heart to not disobey God. God is calling his people, his church, in these last days to purpose in our hearts, to purpose in your heart to obey God to obey him. While the world is growing darker, yes, while the world is growing uh, more evil, yeah. more diabolical, right? Yes, As the world is growing more and more of calling what is evil good and calling what is good evil. Yes, In these times, the church is to grow, the church is to increase in holiness, in righteousness, in faith, in love, in joy, in peace, in long-suffering, in forgiveness. The church is to grow in loving devotion to our God. As the world and those of the world increase in the character of their father, we, the church, are to increase in the character of our father. Hallelujah. And it starts in the heart. 
The heart is the seat of determination, the seat of purpose, the seat of resolution. I pose the question tonight, what have you purposed in your heart concerning the Most High God? What resolution have you established in your heart concerning the things of God? Some of us can recall when we had, we purpose in our heart and we took a stand on the inside and say, I'm not smoking no more. I'm not sleeping around no more. I'm not sinning in this way anymore. I'm not using that type of language anymore. I'm going to obey the Most High God. The heart, the lave, is the seat of determination. The seat of resolution. Or if we, as a church, right, as the, as the Hebrews, as the body of Christ, if we would all take heed to that seat and we would resolve to put the most high God first, to serve him, to read his word, to pray, to be devoted to the most high God, what would the church look like? That we would resolve to not engage in foolish conflict, gossip and slander, hate. I'm talking about the church. That's where it starts. That we would resolve to serve the Most High God. The seat of determination, the seat of resolution, those things are synonymous. So we talked about the heart being several seats, it being the seat of understanding. We looked at Solomon, a great example, right? When you think about wisdom and understanding, who else are you going to think about? Solomon. Talked about the heart being the seat of determination. My nose backwards. <laughs> and our next seat that we'll talk about is the heart being the seat of appetite. The seat of appetites or the seat of passions. Matthew 5, 6 gives us a reference of this. It says this in Matthew 5, 6. It says, blessed are those which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And like most husbands ask their wives, or maybe wives ask their husbands, what are you hungry for? You ever ask your spouse that? What are you hungry for? Yes. Don't know what to eat. But I pose the question in a spiritual sense, concerning your heart, your seat of appetite, your seat of passions. What are you hungry for? Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Are you thirsty for the ways of God? The truth of the matter is that everyone's heart and soul hunger and thirst for something. Something. We can all recall a, a time where we uh, longed, we hungered for the streets, we hungered for the club, we hungered for the things of the world. That's what we wanted to do. Hunger and thirst for something or someone very specific. Does your heart thirst for someone? Psalm 42, 2, my soul thirsts for God. You ever looked at it that way? My soul, my heart, my lave, the seat of my appetite, the seat of my passions, does it thirst for God? For the living God, Psalms 42, 2 says, 
When shall I come and appear before God? You see the eagerness? You see the, 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 the passion, the hunger, the thirst? Yes, like whenever you hunger, you, get, like you run to the table. You drive fast to the buffet. And they still have buffets. You drive fast to Cane's, Chick-fil-A. If somebody calls and say they got a plate, you say, I'm coming. Gas tank on E, I'm coming. It don't matter. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Church, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? What are you hungry for? John 6, 35 says this. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. And he that believes on me shall never thirst. Your heart hungers and thirsts for something and someone very specific. Satisf satisfaction of that hunger is in Christ. And it's only in Christ. He's the only one who can quench that thirst, who can satiate that hunger. The only one. Your heart longs to be forgiven for your sins. It does. And there's no one who can forgive them but Christ. There's no one who suffered and died for sin who's the perfect sacrifice for sin, the unblemished lamb of God. It's only him. And he's enough. And he's enough. You know, sometimes when you're real hungry and you eat something, you'd be like, oh, that wasn't. It wasn't all that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're like, oh, next time I'm going to eat this or something. You start planning. It's not the case with Christ. He satisfies that hunger completely. Like the woman at the well who was thirsty. He said, you can drink of this water and never thirst again. Never thirst again. I want to put this in here. Understand that it's, it's, uh, it's okay and don't condemn yourself. If even as a believer, you find yourself having a hunger to do or a hunger for uh, unrighteous things. Even Paul struggled at times. Yes. You see, sometimes that, that can happen and then you condemn yourself. And then you don't come to church or you come to church and you stand office and it's just a struggle. Yes, sir. But even Paul struggled. I got a Bible for it. It says in Romans 7, 7, 15, Paul said, I don't really understand myself. I, I don't really understand myself for what I want to do. I want to do what is right, but I find myself not doing it. Instead, I, I find myself doing what I hate. I find myself doing what I don't want to do. But if you know what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. I agree Amen. with what the Bible says. I agree that this, this, these desires, this, this hunger is wrong. So I'm not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. In other words, you're right where you're supposed to be. Don't condemn yourself. Don't feel it. Don't, don't think it's strange. And if you, if you talk to a real believer, this Bible for it. You're right where you need to be. <laughs> Don't dwell in it. Expose it. Acknowledge it. It's here. I feel it. God created me a clean heart. Don't just leave me as I am. And he won't. He absolutely will not. The seed of appetites, yeah. your heart, the seed of passions. Yeah, yeah. Your heart, good ground. 
your heart being the seat of appetites, my reference is, the seat of understanding, and the seat of determination and resolution. This will probably be our last point, but hang with me. Lastly, or for this sermon, this, this message, your heart being the seat of courage and determination. Your heart, your lave, is the seat of courage and determination. The very first occasion that we see this Hebrew word for heart, lave, is in Genesis 6, verse 5 and 6. The Bible reads, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That every imagination of the hearts, I'm sorry, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented God. It repented the Lord that he made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. Did you know that the thoughts of your heart, they move God? The thoughts of your heart moves God. What was in the heart of mankind at that time was only wicked constantly, continually. It means night, day, midday, around the clock. It was only evil continually. And the Bible says it it repented the Lord, meaning it made God grieve. Is what in your heart making God grieve? The second question I want to ask is, what are the imaginations of the thoughts of your heart? What are the imaginations of the thoughts of your heart? And I pose these questions, not just to you, these questions that the Lord asked me through, the, through studying, questions I ask myself. What are the imaginations of the thoughts of your heart? Are they wicked continually? Can you acknowledge that your heart is depraved? Can you acknowledge that you are a sinner and that you have fallen short of the glory of God? Can you acknowledge it? Your heart is the seat of your thoughts and imagination, which, is, which should have been point D. Your heart is the seat of your imagination and your thoughts. Take heed to your thoughts. Take heed to your imagination. From your thoughts, from your imagination, good things can come forth. Woody inventions, wisdom in uh, how to, uh, a vision for creating a business, of supplying a need, meeting a need in the marketplace, a vision for your family. Your heart is the seat of your thoughts and imaginations. The vision you had for your life, for your career, it began in your heart. The good sense of your heart being the seat of your thoughts and imaginations. But as we just said, every heart has its weakness. Every heart from every heart has come sin. We can say that confidently because the Bible tells us that every, uh, everyone, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And those sins that we've committed, 
they came from the seat of our thoughts and imagination. The point of it all is for us to understand, yeah, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short. We're all in need of a savior. And that Savior is Jesus. We reference, reference him several times here tonight. You heard his name before. Some of you have called upon him. Called upon him every Tuesday, every Sunday. But some tonight, this may be that, that first time, so to speak, where you heard the word of God in a sense where, yeah, it's time. Yeah, like, Tonight's the night. Like I'm ready to give my life to the Most High God. I'm ready, to, I'm ready to really acknowledge that I've sinned, I've fallen short, I understand how my heart is, I want this new heart that I'm hearing of, about it being clean, about it being renewed, I, I want that new life that I'm, I'm hearing about. It may be our youth in here tonight may be a visitor, whoever it may be, God knows. And there's some things that we just need to know about how to be saved. Simply, number one, we just acknowledge that we all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. And every soul that sinned, the Bible says, must what? Die. A spiritual and physical death. Our sins separate us from the Most High God. Separate us from... That those plans and purposes that he has on our lives that we talked about in point number one. So it leaves us out in the cold. Can't save ourselves, can't deliver ourselves. But here comes Jesus, sent by the Father, the only begotten Son. He came for a purpose. He didn't just walk the earth, but he walked. And he had a heart like yours. But guess what? It was sinless. He had every seat that we talked about here tonight. But all of those seats were undefiled. The same way we talked about those seats, and we can all attest that there's some sin, there's some, some ungodliness upon those seats, upon the seat of his heart. Righteousness. Amen, amen. Holiness. <laughs> obedience. That makes him the unblemished lamb of God. It makes him that perfect sacrifice. Sacrifice, what you mean? Meaning every soul that sins, yeah, you must sin because you died. I must, I must die because I sinned. The death that I deserve, he took it on the cross, on the hill called Calvary. The blood that I was supposed to bleed out on that cross, on a, he took it. He didn't just do it for me, but he did it for you. He did it for you as well. And it's simple, really. All you got to do is believe. Not believe intellectually, not believe the knowledge, not believe the information, but apply it with the seed of your understanding, the seed of your passions, the seed of your imagination. Envision him on that cross and say, yeah, I believe that. And I believe that's my payment for my debt, my sin debt. Believe in your heart. He suffered, he died, he buried, he was buried. On the third day, he rose again. And then with your mouth, you confess it. Why? Because out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. What's in your heart professes out of your mouth. If that's you here tonight, every head bow, every eye closed. If that's you here tonight, you want to be saved, you don't need to stand up. But I want you to show God that you're serious. Just raise your hand real quick. Just raise your hand. If this message stuck, stroke, you know, striked you in some way where you're like, hey, God, I want to rededicate myself. I want to affirm myself in you. If that's you, just raise your hand. I don't need to see it. God needs to see it. He sees it. That's what matters. He sees it. You can put your hands down.
when we pray, all I ask, on the, I request on the, on the behalf of the Most High, pray from the seat of your heart. Repeat after me, Most High God, I come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, who is the payment for my sins. I've sinned several times, not just one. And I bring my sin self to you, asking that you save me, that you would deliver me, and that you would heal me in the name of your son, Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, was wrongfully accused, suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose. And in that resurrection, he conquered sin in my life. Thank you for setting me free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you all for coming to Bible study. Let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight for a good Tuesday. Thank you for your word, your rich, nourishing word, Father. Pray for your people that you would lead them and guide them in all that they do, Lord God. I pray that this word would just continue to minister to us, Lord God, as we leave, just like the word from Sunday, God. No matter who teaches, Father, your word is your word, and it's rich, it's complex, and it's sufficient for what we need. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace in your heart. Shalom peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Glory.